and welcome to Note Doctors. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In this podcast, we will be talking about all things theory with some of the best music theory teachers in the country. If you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Note Doctors. Before we get going with our interview with Dr. Elizabeth West Marvin, I wanted to remind you all to rate, review, share, subscribe, let friends know about Note Doctors, um, write a review, uh, put a five-star rating on iTunes. All those things help us reach a larger audience. So today we are talking with uh, Dr. Marvin. And so Jen, tell us a little bit about her. All right. So Elizabeth West Marvin is the Minahan family professor and professor of music theory at the Eastman School of Music. Her research interests include music cognition, absolute pitch, pedagogical implications of music cognitive research, and comparisons between language and music processing. She's a past president of the Society for Music Theory and the Music Theory Society of New York State. Her articles have appeared in Music Theory Spectrum, Journal of Music Theory, Music Perception, and Journal of Music Theory Pedagogy, among others. She is the 2013 recipient of the Gail Boyd Stwolinski Prize for the Lifetime Achievement in Music Theory Teaching and Scholarship, and she's the co-author of the Musician's Guide series of textbooks with Jane Clendenning, Joel Phillips, and Paul Murphy. Those are put out by W.W. Norton. We had a wonderful conversation with her. We're excited for you to listen in. That's the way I feel about our book, too, that I want it to be relevant to young music makers, and I want musicianship to be up front and forward. So we tried in every chapter to have applications, you know, we're learning about cadences. Why is this important? How might you interpret a uh, conclusive cadence versus a less conclusive one? Or in the rhythm chapters, you know, what is what are the implications of hypermeter for performance? How might you think about this in one instead of in four? And, you know, throughout we try to talk about performance applications. And I think that's part of this musician's guide um, emphasis. So today's very special guest for our 10th episode is Dr. Elizabeth West Marvin. And so we are so pleased to have you on uh, our, our podcast. And, you know, the first thing that we would like to ask our guests is a little, just a little bit of background about um, how they got into theory. You know, how did you know you wanted to be a theory instructor? And then how did you break that news to your parents? You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be the 10th uh, participant. Um, I think your question is very well put, actually, because I floated around different majors. I grew up as a choir kid, and I played piano and organ, and I went to a liberal arts college, the College of Worcester. And there, I knew I wanted to be a musician, but I didn't know what kind. So I um, floated around with different specialties within music, and I studied voice and organ and theory composition, and I ended up doing a double major in theory comp. Um, and I think that um, having different majors helped me understand different kinds of students. So I think that's actually very important. And I also had an interesting experience there where I had a full year of fixed dose solfege with a person who studied with Nadia Boulanger mm. and a full year of movable dose solfege with someone who had studied at Eastman. And again, that's not ideal for students, but it was great for me going into uh, teaching later on. I had a good sense of what the advantages of each system are. Uh, but then I came to Eastman. I started there for a master's uh, in composition with organ as my instrument. And by the time I eventually graduated with my PhD, I was in music theory with voice as my instrument. So I'm really grateful that I was able to um, explore uh, different mm -hmm. aspects of music. And once I graduated, I joined the faculty at Eastman. So I've really been here for my whole career. I had a little bit of time between my master's and doctorate. And I taught in a small community college in uh, uh, the Los Angeles area before mm -hmm. I came back to Eastman. And uh, at Eastman, I've, uh, you know, I've had various 
teaching and administrative roles. I was academic dean for a while. I've been chair of the department a few times. Um, and I like the variety that that provides. And then in the discipline, I've been president of the uh, Music Theory Society of New York State and also the Society for Music Theory. Um, and my research is tied to my teaching. I, I started out doing post-tonal theory and uh, analysis performance, especially when I was a more active singer. Um, and now it's mostly music theory, pedagogy, and music cognition. Mm -hmm. So all of this, and also a textbook author, which I know we're going to talk about uh, today. <laughs> right. So that's the mini bio. <laughs> that's, that's great. And so when you were an undergrad and you had fixed dough for a year, movable dough, was there one method that you found that you latched onto more, or was there more, one that's more challenging for you? You know, it's kind of funny. I sort of taught myself to sight sing when I was a kid. So I already had an internalized system, which I would never tell anybody to do today. I sang by interval. And so fixed though taught me more about, you know, reading notes on the staff <laughs> and changing clefs and all that kind of stuff. But it was in my sophomore year when I had movable dough that everything kind of clicked. You know, first I had sung by intervals, then I had sung by notes, and then I learned about function as a sophomore in college. And that really, really opened up my eyes. I, I learned a lot about music by, uh, by having that movable system and functional system. Yeah. Yeah, I think they all serve a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. I've never seen students kind of be harmed by having to learn a new way. In fact, in in Texas here, they all learn law-based minor in school, or it's pretty common mm -hmm. for them to learn law-based minor in school. And we're a dough-based minor school here because of how we do harmonic dictation. And I frequently tell students, it's not going to hurt you. Having more than one way helps you understand it better, not worse, uh, because there's often kind of a... a sort of hard curve at the beginning where they're, they struggle to shift to a new system, but the systems all have advantages and disadvantages. So, yeah, I agree. And uh, what we do at Eastman, you know, we talk in the pedagogy class, especially about having one system that's fixed or phenomenal. So they learn about, you know, reading notes and a different system that is functional. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can either do uh, fixed dough and numbers, or you can do movable dough and letter names, but it's a way to have those two things working together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. So do you, uh, as far as in your own teaching at Eastman, do you have students do one type or do you kind of um, have a variety? You know, at Eastman, we um, currently do fixed dough plus numbers. But the students who are music education majors are in separate sections where they do movable dough for mm -hmm. similar reason to what Jen said, so mm -hmm. that they're learning something um, that they'll be using in their school system, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which is a movable dough system. Mm -hmm. Now, they also do law minor, but I don't think we do law minor in the collegiate classes. I think everything's dough minor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, similar thing. Yeah. But... Um, you know, again, in both classes, they have some kind of system that's fixed and some kind of system that's functional. So most theory, theory instructors that I know have thought for at least for 15 seconds that I should write a theory book. <laughs> <laughs> we run into something, we see an error in a book or something, or we have a really great lesson. We're like, well, I should turn that into a book. <laughs> and then 15 seconds passes and we realize that's a terrible yeah. idea. <laughs> that's like the worst thing that we should do. Well, you've had that idea, but you actually have written books. Um, so talk, talk to us a little bit about um, the impetus for how, how do you go from, you know, that initial thought to actually going through with it? Uh I mentioned that I went through several majors as an undergraduate. I don't think I said that I started as a music education major. Mm. So I, I always knew that I wanted to teach. Uh, and then when I got into music theory, like you just described, I kept noticing things in books that I didn't like. Um, and I was advised by faculty older and wiser than I was that one should not try to write a textbook um, before tenure. <laughs> so, and I am completely on board with that now that I know how much work it is. But um, the books that I uh, was thinking about were my own undergraduate text, which was the Robert Ottman Harmony book, mm -hmm. not 
we, we used his sight singing, which is more famous, but he had a harmony book too. Mm -hmm. And also my first teaching job, I was asked to teach out of the Piston book. So between Ottman and Piston, there was a very vertical view of chords and not a very good understanding of progression. Um, so that was one thing that made me think about um, writing my own book. And then when I got to Eastman, I was a TA and I taught out of Aldwell Schachter, which has a wonderful sense of progression and linear motion, but it's very hard for students to read sometimes. And it's mm -hmm. also very piano centric and very great man sort of centric. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I was uh, thinking about too. So um, after tenure, I started uh, more seriously thinking about writing. And I would say that really important thing is to find a good co-author. I think mm. uh, Jane Clendenning and I got together um, and also with Norton, our publisher, and started brainstorming about, you know, our pedagogical ideas. Um, I think that having a co-author is really, really valuable because you bring different things to the project. Mm. Our, our books, you know, have a harmony book and a workbook and an anthology, but also a sight singing book and a dictation book. And we brought on additional co-authors for that. Joel Phillips um, uh, was the first one who really got going on our um, uh, our skills portion and then Paul Murphy. And each one of us brings different uh, expertise and we can critique each other and help each other when there are big deadlines coming up. You know, if one person is completely overwhelmed, there's another person to pick up the slack, mm -hmm. you know, so I am a real uh, proponent of that. Um, so I think that's part of what helped uh, helped me give myself permission to do it, that I had <laughs> somebody else to uh, bounce ideas off of mm -hmm. and uh, share the load. It is a big load. I mean, you think about writing a textbook and you think about the initial stages of writing it, <laughs> but there's a huge process of peer review where the manuscripts are sent out across the country to teachers and different kinds mm -hmm. of institutions. They send you back um, edits. Those edits might contradict with each other and then you have to decide, you know, wh which way do you want to go? Um, they might bring up things that you completely forgot to deal with and you have to rewrite that. Uh, and then it goes out for a second round of reviews and so you deal with those reviews. Uh, and then once you get into a final manuscript, then you have page proofs and multiple iterations of page proofs. And then for our book, there are recordings that go with everything. Uh -huh. So I've been become a you know recording engineer and I uh, mm. recruit recruit players and I listen and edit and you know so it's a big big project. The recordings are all Eastman students. I have a headache. So I know, right, Paul? Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> the recordings are almost all um, faculty and students from Eastman. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a vital yeah. part of the whole project. I mean, and it makes you know, or breaks it a lot of the time. It's really enjoyable, too. I mean, it's, again, a lot of work, but it's so it's so fun to have that musical piece um, going into it and working with the performers at Eastman who are fantastic. So oh, yeah. I really, even though it's an added something to the mm -hmm. textbook writing, it's really an enjoyable part of it. Yeah. Well, we just finished the recordings for the fourth edition a couple of weeks ago. That's what I was about to ask Wait, about. I'll... I know the fourth edition is coming out. In fact, I already have my kind of review copy. We're using yeah. the third edition. Uh, we use the third yeah. edition right now. This is not a sponsored <laughs> post. We're not. This is not a promotional. No, but I, I just I, got my copy as well. Yeah, I right. have looked it over. So, can you tell us a little bit about what's new in the fourth edition? What has changed? How the book has evolved? Yeah. Um, one of the things uh, that we had decided to do when we began the fourth edition before this upheaval in our field was to diversify the repertoire. So we've put a featured a piece by a woman in every single chapter out of 40 chapters in the book. We have increased the number of uh, pieces by black and Hispanic composers. So we've really, uh, really done a deep dive into repertoire. We, we spent countless hours just looking for, finding, listening to, downloading scores, trying to find pieces that would, you know, uh, illustrate what we needed them to illustrate. Uh, we have in the anthology 20 new pieces by uh, women and composers of color um, in addition to what we had had there uh, before. So that's been exciting and stimulating and fun for us, I think, to, um, 
to learn new pieces and mm -hmm. to find, like we have this wonderful set of uh, piano variations by a woman named Marianne Arnhammer, whom I had never heard of before. Um, and it's on um, the uh, themes from the Magic Flute. She was a mm -hmm. pianist and she used to play duo piano with Mozart. And she took mm -hmm. the one of the um, uh, arias from the Magic Flute and did a set of variations on. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. teaching piece, you know. So mm -hmm. we found it. It was in a terrible score. We had to make a modern edition. We had to figure out which accidentals that were left out should be there. And, you know, mm -hmm. it was a we did a lot of realizing figured bases and trying to make pieces that might not be easily accessible to students mm -hmm. available in uh, both scores and recordings. So that's one of the biggest things is, yeah. you know, really looking at the repertoire and trying to make it more diverse. Uh, we also try in each edition to update terminology and things to be con um, contemporary with the field. Um, so that the book never seems old fashioned in any way mm -hmm. that we are trying to stay with what's going on in the discipline. So uh, one of the other changes we made was to uh, revamp the sonata form uh, terminology to correspond with what's increasingly uh, being used in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are a couple of the changes. That's great. I know you mentioned, you know, revisiting kind of your questions of repertory. You know, in a lot of my own investigations and my own revamping of, of curricula, you know, I found that, you know, obtaining really good recordings and really good scores, it's it's very difficult. And you have to be willing to overcome that challenge of it. You have to be able to take the plunge and say, this is worth it. And, you know, become, you know, a finale master or a Sibelius master <laughs> and enter these things in the finale and get them where they look really good in your homeworks, you know, and your, and your class notes and things like that, because it requires more effort to do that. And I think all of us here certainly think it's, it's worth it to do. So it's really, absolutely, really a big shout out and a big kudos mm -hmm. to you for, for taking that plunge. Yeah, it's exactly true. I mean, the fact that it's um, that these are old um, publications, you know, like you might download something off of ISMLP and then you discover it's, you know, crinkly little handwriting on a <laughs> thousand times Xerox score, it's all gray, and, you know, but yeah. and we make it something that can be used. The other thing I didn't mention is that we expanded our coverage of popular music. Mm. So there are now two chapters on popular music. One is more focused on blues and rock and jazz early uh and then one is on more recent music including rap and loop bass songs and so mm -hmm. on so um that is another way to get into diversity in terms of um the composers and performers and types of repertoire mm -hmm. is that an area where you had to kind of stretch yourself or is that an area where you already felt really comfortable i know i teach a jazz class here at dbu it's become one of my favorite things that i do and I've always loved jazz, but early on, I felt like I was kind of learning jazz theory with them. Um, so for me, it was early on a stretch. And now, you know, I'm I really love it. But I wondered that about the pop music chapters. Was that something that? Yeah. For me, it's a stretch. But this is another joy of having a co-author mm -hmm. because uh, Jane Clendenning does work in popular music and she keeps up with that, uh, both with the repertoire and with the theory. So um, I feel pretty confident that what we have in there is, you know, sort of correctly reflects uh, current practice. And I've learned a lot myself. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges with doing popular music is that we have set before us this challenge of every example in the book you can, especially in the ebook, you can click on it and hear mm -hmm. it. And everything in the anthology, you can hear it. But with popular music, <laughs> If, you know, you don't want to make your cheesy covers of, of contemporary <laughs> music, you know. Um, so. you, you don't sing Katy Perry? You don't, <laughs> don't do Katy Perry karaoke? <laughs> we have a couple of, we do have a couple of, uh, of Eastman students singing and playing pop music here and there, but not very much. What, what Jane has uh, really done a good job at, and actually John Kovach does this in his pop music book too, is creating things like form charts where you can go to YouTube or go to Spotify and find, you know, the recording of the original artist and then follow our form chart with timings or, or um, 
you know, bits of lyrics to help you uh, find your way through. And that's wonderful ear training, mm -hmm. you know, to follow these recordings with the form chart or create your own form chart. It's really puts to use a lot of the skills that we're teaching our students. Absolutely. So, yeah, where that chapter is included in theory two here because our industry students only go through level two and I'm teaching theory two yeah. right now. And one of them was looking at syllabus on the first day and said, I see the topic of popular music. Is that for real? <laughs> I said, it's totally for real. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. So, yeah, they're very excited. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Well, I'll be interested to hear how they do with the you know the listening charts and so on yeah i thought those were a great tool as i was prepping for the semester kind of looking ahead at what we'd be doing i thought man these are going to be really good for them to use what they're learning in oral skills class apply it to what we're doing in here so yeah one of the things that i was um, thinking about i know one of the things you're going to ask me about is uh, what the book might look like in the future and one of the things that i've we've already been thinking about is its use in AP music theory classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, it, it turns out the way we've positioned the popular music chapters right now, they're later on mm -hmm. in the book. And that means that AP classes won't ever get to them. So mm -hmm. it's possible that that first popular music chapter might move earlier, mm -hmm. uh, just in order to make it available to kids who only take a, you know two mm -hmm. semesters or, or, or in high mm -hmm. school. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the challenge with, of course, popular music is that there's not the score. And in music theory, you're so used to look, taking a look at the score, analyzing the score, and it's all it's all audio. And so I enjoy being able to see the different charts and the, the different kind of uh, showings of energy and, mm. and all these different ways of visually representing mm -hmm. this music so that students can latch on to it because there's not, you know, sure, you could look at a score that would be, you know, for a pop song, but it's not it's just going to be a piano reduction and a vocal line that doesn't have any of the artistry that's on the recording. And it doesn't have all the production mm -hmm. of all of all of the studio production that's on there. So being able to use other visuals, I think is helpful, especially with the, the popular music. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's really important for students. I, I was, I was thinking about something you said earlier with um, the title of it, because you mentioned um, you mentioned the Harmony book by Ottman. I think Piston's theory book is called just Harmony, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, and how I appreciate that your book is called The Musician's Guide to Theory and Analysis. There's no mention of Harmony in the <laughs> title uh, because we tend to think, oh, that's it's just it's all about pitch, right? And and there's rhythm, there's form, there's all these other things. So could you talk a little bit about why it was important to to use that title, I guess, and what does that encapsulate and how does that broaden what, you know, theory is sometimes thought of? I'll give a shout out here to um, David Butler, who's a retired faculty member from Ohio State University. He wrote a book about music cognition called The Musician's Guide to Perception and Cognition. And I like the ring of that. And I like that book very much because a lot of the music cognition books before that had been aimed at scientists and psychologists. And this one right up front said, The Musician's Guide to Perception mm -hmm. and Cognition. And um, that's the way I feel about our book, too, that I want it to be relevant to young music makers. And I want musicianship to be up front and forward. So we tried in every chapter to have applications. You know, we're learning about cadences. Why is this important? How might you interpret a uh, conclusive cadence versus a less conclusive one or in the rhythm chapters you know what is what are the implications of hypermeter for performance how might you think about this in one instead of in four and you know throughout we try to talk about performance applications and I think that's part of this musician's guide um, mm -hmm. emphasis and then we also have um, like style composition you know writing in the writing a parallel periods and writing a small minuet and compose, you know, composing in the style of, mm -hmm. and that's another aspect of the musician's guide. We really want to make it not be abstract and removed from the music that they love. Mm -hmm. um, all too often kids come into music theory and they just see 
you know, even species counterpoint has that problem of being whole notes <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, chorales being just half notes or quarter notes. And the music that they love, of course, is highly embellished and um, it can create a kind of um, barrier between what they love and why they're there and what they're being sort of forced or required mm. to study. Mm. So, uh, you know, our attempt is to make it as musical and as relevant as possible. Mm. Um, so that's sort of a, a long-winded answer to why we came up with that title. It's, it's both um, a response to David Butler's work and a response to just trying to make music theory as musical as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny that, uh, you know, I know our question was about the term musicians, but to me, actually, what comes through is actually guide the fact that <laughs> you're almost admitting in a certain way that this is not, you know, written on stone tablets, that, you know, it is something that is a guide that, you know, it's kind of like a recipe. You get a recipe. My mom always said a recipe is a guideline. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. nothing that's set in stone forever and ever. You know, it's changing. And this is something that you start with, really, you know, as part of just your exploration of music, you know, as a musician. So, you know, that's really interesting because uh, and then when Paul originally asked the question, he said, theory and analysis, not harmony. <laughs> so there's three aspects, the musician, then the guide, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then theory and analysis. All yeah. three parts of the title have have some kind of uh, hidden message or something. <laughs> yeah. I think so. And, and I think it's important, uh, I'll just say this in terms of uh, the theory and analysis part, that it's not just a part writing book. There's all through it are, you know, linear aspects, contrapuntal, formal, so that students are looking at real pieces and full pieces from the very beginning. And that's one of the reasons that we have the anthology, so that they're not just looking at eight measures of this, four measures mm -hmm. of that, four measures of something else, but they can see the whole context in a, in a real living piece of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned the short compositions as well. I think personally, you know, confessions of a theorist here <laughs> that when I first started teaching, I did far less of these short compositions than I, than I do now. Now I try to incorporate some sort of short composition uh, almost every class, you know, even if mm -hmm. it's just a few uh, sketchings of a melody or a few sketchings of a, a lead sheet or something. And you know, even that, just doing that, it really makes, I think, it come alive a little bit more when they get to hear something that they wrote themselves. I completely agree. When I took over, well, at Eastman in our curriculum, we have sort of guidelines for each semester of what should happen in the curriculum. And when I took over second semester freshman uh, written theory a couple years ago, I looked at what I was supposed to accomplish, you know, and right there it said, by the end of the semester, students will write a minuet for string quartet. <laughs> so oh I nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> really? I have to do, uh, first of all, a minuet, and second of all, string quartet, you know. And... Uh, over the course of the, so I ended up making that be the trajectory of the whole semester. You know, first we'll write these parallel periods. Then we'll learn how to modulate to five because you're going to need that for your minuet. <laughs> then we're going to learn, you know, Monte, Ponte, and Fonte. You're going to need that for your minuet and secondary dominance and sequence. But, you know, and so by the end, we've been building all mm -hmm. semester to the minuet. Then I actually invited a string quartet, a graduate string quartet and their coach in to perform and talk mm -hmm. about you know, what's idiomatic for violin and um, the, the quartet played a piece and talked about how the instruments interact. And um, then at the end, the students sketched their minuet and had meetings with TAs and coached mm -hmm. them. Then they performed them in their small sections and voted on the best ones. And then the best <laughs> ones came to our big class and we voted on the best ones of those. And then I awarded prizes of um, <laughs> gift certificates to the local coffee shop. Oh, and wow. it's, it, it was the highlight of my semester every year that I taught it because, you know, the whole thing was building to that. And then we had this wonderful concert at the end and everybody got to vote for their favorites. And there was, you know, lots of buy-in. And sometimes a student who had been kind of a middling student all semester suddenly just blooms when they can do something creative, you know. And somebody I never would have expected wins the top prize or the second top hmm. prize. It's It's really gratifying you feel like this proud mother um who's birthed all these little minuets i mean it's really it's really great 
So I'm a big fan of style composition now, and I really hadn't done that much of it before trying to work it into the book and then work it into my classes. Um, so I think it's an important thing. It's definitely a good tool. I'm wondering, so you've been at Eastman a long time, and um, it's, court, of course, one of the great conservatories that we have. And so you've had this perspective of working with really phenomenal musicians across your career. What have you seen that about students that has like stayed ever the same? And what are the things that you're like, yeah, it used to be like this and now it's really different. Oh, that's a great question. Um, Cause I've been thinking about how teaching was different as opposed to how the mm. students are different. So maybe I'll answer yeah. both of those things. Yeah. Um, the students are wonderful performers. Um, and that's really gratifying uh, in terms of being a teacher. Despite the fact that they are um, surrounded by easy ways to get music, <laughs> you know, like YouTube and Spotify and, you know, all kinds of streaming possibilities, they still don't know a lot of repertoire when they arrive at school, except what they play themselves. So, um, and I think that maybe is, has gotten a little worse over mm -hmm. time. Like they come with very kind of myopic view of, of music. Mm -hmm. So one of our jobs is to expand that. And, and the whole discussion about diversity plays into that, um, you know, just giving them more opportunities to hear new pieces and um, new genres and all of that. Um, so I think probably I'd have to say that students are coming a little less well-prepared in terms of music fundamentals. Mm -hmm than they used to and keyboard skills um, and singing for that mm. matter. Okay. So all three things. <laughs> well, I have to say it's sort uh -oh. of comforting. Well, adding up here, I, I think it's kind of comforting though, to hear that that's the case at Eastman, right? We're all like, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, that's the yeah. case for us too. Well, when we give placement tests at the beginning of the semester, um, we identify students who need remediation and we also identify students on the other end who can go into an honors track. And then there's the great middle. But over the years, the number who need remediation has grown. And so um, we changed our curriculum just this year to have a different way to treat remediation. And I can talk about that in a minute. So that's um, one thing that's different. And the thing I meant about not being able to sing was just that um, students don't sing as much recreationally, except maybe along with the, yeah. you know, radio or iPod or whatever, so that they don't know their voices and they don't know how mm -hmm. it, the voice works. And so they get into sight singing class and that's all really new for them. And some of them, just once they figure out how their voices work, really excel. Uh, and then others have bigger problems, but I do think they come in with less experience singing. Yeah, even just Tessa Tura, just what key would you like it in? And I don't know. Yeah, they don't know their own ranges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and their Tessa Tura, their, their range is very narrow. You know, they you really have to, I strongly believe you need to do some sort of choral vocal warm ups and exercises to get them used to singing and singing together and um, mm -hmm. stretching their range and that kind of thing. And it helps them sing more in tune and helps them sing together better. It's, all good. Yeah. How does in, your vocal background, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. how does your vocal background kind of assist with um, your teaching sightseeing? My wife is a choir director. And so when I started teaching her skills, I was asking her things all the time about singing and just all, production and all these things because, and she has this wealth of information. She's like, oh yeah, this, your, your introduction to oral skills is just like my seventh grade yeah. women's choir. <laughs> and we're basically yeah. doing the same thing. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, but that was invaluable information. It's very much the same. I think that um, having a choral background just for the choral warmups really, really helps. At the beginning of our um, academic year each year, when it's not COVID time, uh, we do what we call um, TA boot camp. And we have all the TAs come you know, four or five days early and they help us with the placement testing and all that. But they also uh, have workshops where we talk about pedagogy and then we have them all sample teach for each other so that when they first get in the classroom, it's not their first time 
teaching. They've done it for each other. And one of the things that I've done for many years is a kind of a, a boot camp of vocal warm ups, just to, you know, what are you accomplishing? We have two kinds, um, vocal warm ups and brain warm ups, <laughs> where, you know, the vocal warm ups are to work on production and stretch your range and get them to feel comfortable with support and breath control and um, get just bringing the class to attention, having them all stand up and sing together gets gets the class started. And then sometimes you can have them assign uh, numbers or solfege to their warm ups, and that's a kind of brain warm up to get them thinking about function or um, having them, you know, tune chords or sing progressions, things like that, uh, that are good brain warm ups. So I think it's really good to have some vocal background. And if you don't have vocal background, background to think about how important it is to uh, take what we know from choral singing and apply it to the art. Absolutely. Class. I actually have a, a dear friend who is from South Africa and she came to the U.S. to do her doctorate. And um, she asked me one time, she was like, I have a very important question for you and I need you to answer it. Why on earth do theorists teach oral skills in the United States? And I was like, who teaches it in South Africa? Like in my mind, that's just, that's what we do. They're united. You know, they're, they're one thing. Yeah. She's like the choir teachers, of course. And I, I thought know, that is so interesting. And it does make its own kind yeah. of sense that, that that's who would mm -hmm. teach those classes. Mm -hmm. We're kind of equipped in different ways, yeah. but it's very useful to have those skills for sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think one thing that's different in the United States is that a lot of curricula here try to make the oral skills classes track with the written theory. You know, so like in our oral skills books, they track chapter by chapter with concepts. And when you have the choral director or a whole different solfege department, you know, they may have different goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. So you have to do some good talking to each other to make sure you're all accomplishing the same thing. <laughs> but I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah. And I'm also glad you mentioned the TA workshop because I've been mm -hmm. recent, I recently started one at North Texas mm -hmm. and uh, I've kind of been redesigning it and redesigning and redesigning. <laughs> I've redesigned it like three or four times, but I'd love to talk to you more about that sometime <laughs> outside of the podcast, of course. Yeah. But it's such an important thing to give them it, the right start. I think it's really, really important. First of all, it builds community and camaraderie so that the new graduate students meet everybody else. They all realize we're in this you know, together for the best interest of our students. And then you get a unified sort of pedagogical approach. So you don't have one TA heading off and doing what they were taught in high school, which is really different from what the professor wants, you know, so it's a good way to set the tone for the semester and the year. Yep. You know, you asked before about how students changed over my career. And I said, I was thinking you were gonna ask about how teaching changed. And I just wanted to say, how um, technology has changed mm -hmm. teaching. I, mm -hmm. When I first started teaching, every piece you taught in class, you had to go find in the library and check it out. You know, and every, mm -hmm. in our library, you could only check recordings out for like three hours. So you had to show up at 8 a.m. to get the recording that you wanted. So you check out a score, you check out a recording. If you want students to see it, you have to make copies of all, you know. So mm -hmm. the idea that now you can get free PDFs of public domain works. You can find anything you want on, you know, YouTube. It's just completely transformational in terms of the teacher's workload and accessibility. Like you can sit in 10 minutes and compare three different performers and decide which one you like the best, yeah. as opposed to checking out three <laughs> records and queuing them all up. You know, it's just so different. Um, and also just the ability to well, as Ben said, you know, be able to use music notation programs, have be able to produce something that looks good, yeah. um, to project in your classroom so everybody can see the scores instead of, you know, overhead projectors with only transparencies, which is what we started with. Um, so it's, that's one thing that has changed in the teaching world. Yeah. And another thing that's changed in the teaching world, and I have to get my uh, shout outs here too, is that music theory pedagogy is actually a thing now. It's a discipline in our field, whereas it was really kind of hidden. You have a few people in an interest group. Now we have our own journal, your podcast, 
Um, we have conferences. We have research books. I mean, it's such a different world where pedagogy is uh, respected as a research discipline and ideas are shared so um, generously and easily. It's quite a different context for teaching. That's great. You mentioned remediation. Could you go into more detail about that? It's something we all deal with. It's something we've definitely all talked about. And it's some, it's such a struggle. It's hard to know how to do it the right way. Uh, you don't want kids to feel like they're starting off behind, but you also don't want to throw them into a class where they aren't ready. It's such a complicated thing. So how do you, how do you deal with it? Yeah. Um, over the years, we've tried many different things and we've just started this year something new. So um, I'll tell you what we're doing now and then I'll backtrack and tell you what we've tried before. Um, our students, will have five semesters of theory. They'll have a placement at the beginning. If they need remediation, they'll do that first and then the four core semesters. If they don't need remediation, they'll do the four core semesters and then a uh, freely chose elective in theory, which could be counterpoint or it could be songwriting or pop music or recent music or um, you know, you name it, composer-based course, the string quartets of, you know, Haydn, <laughs> you know. So um, it's uh, four in the middle. You either have remediation and then the four, or you have the four and then the bonus course. Um, that means that our core curriculum begins in the second semester of the first year. So the kids will have the remediation if they need it, and then everybody starts with the main theory in the mm. second semester. So we don't have what some kind, sometimes called trailer courses, or we used to call them offbeats. We used to have those at Eastman um, who were off by one semester. We're not going to do that. It's hard to staff, and it's mm -hmm. it gives students that feeling that they're, you know, lesser than because they're in the trailer course. We don't want to do that. So we'll see how this works. I think there's a lot um, to speak in favor of it because those students who need the remediation are getting both written and oral remediation in that first semester and a whole semester of it to get ready for the core start in the spring. And then the kids who don't need it get the bonus course at the end. So, you know, they might have analysis of performance or music cognition or, you know, something that really interests them that they can choose, jazz theory, um, mm -hmm. any of those. Um, the way we used to do it, I also thought was successful, which was, again, we had the placement test and we created what we called uh, freshman intensive. And the freshman intensive class met for the whole freshman year more hours than the other classes. So they would have an extra hour of oral skills, an extra hour of written theory, and they would include remediation in the beginning and then gradually catch up with everyone else. And then they were mainstreamed the sophomore year. So the first year they were all together in the intensive freshman and then they came together with everyone else in the sophomore. And I thought that worked pretty well too. You would think that they might feel like they're being segregated off into a lesser than kind of thing, but in fact, they had great camaraderie and they knew that they needed what we were offering. And they were not, I don't think, too resentful of having the extra hour because they were getting extra hour of tension practice and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, but the problem, the reason that we changed this year is that there just came to be so many of them that it was hard to mm -hmm. staff that intensive class for so many students. And at some point when you think if this many students need mm -hmm. you know, intensive help, then maybe our curriculum is starting too high and we need to recalibrate them. Yeah, okay. we're about 50-50 here at this point, 50% mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. test into theory one and yeah, need it. and 50% end up in fundamentals and or our introductor, introductory course for oral skills. So yeah, it's about 50-50. And I've wondered the same thing. Like if, if half of them need remediation, yeah. you know, are we, how do we adjust to get that number lower? Yeah. 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 And I love I think the... a lot of schools are asking that same question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I really like how you have those had those extra times because that's been a difficult thing this past year, the current year that we're in for our incoming students who are in a fundamentals or intro and we're all online. And so it's been really difficult uh, to get those students really in and 
kind of get them, I think, up to speed. And so we're going to be struggling for a while because of just the the lack of per, like face to face contact. And so I was curious to see how how theory instruction has been for you this past year with the pandemic and how it's changed. Yeah, it's been a challenge for everyone. Um, I'll tell you what happened at Eastman, uh, and then I'll tell you a little about about my own experience. And that is that um, the administration decided that they would um, preference our physical buildings to performance activities. So lessons, um, chamber music, and ensembles. So students did come back and they did have lessons, chamber music, and ensemble on site in the building. But every single academic class was both online and asynchronous in the fall because there were a number of students who lived in China or on the West Coast or who couldn't easily make a synchronous class. So that meant, you know, serious rethinking of everything. You know, if you're, you know, first of all, not seeing the people in person and also not seeing them in Zoom or anything, it's yeah. all asynchronous um, teaching. It was really challenging. So what ended up happening is that we used things like office hours or review sessions or things like that as opportunities to do face-to-face -face teaching that weren't required, but they were offered so that mm -hmm. students could have face-to-face -face contact if they wanted to. Classes that were small enough and could find a time when everyone was available went ahead and had some synchronous classes. Um, but a lot of it was, was this asynchronous teaching. So I got to know, all of us got to know, you know, Zoom very well. We used Blackboard and we used a lot of um, a Blackboard add-on called VoiceThread. Do you guys yeah. know about that? Yeah. It's a really good add-on, I think, where students can easily upload little videos of themselves either having a discussion about something or possibly sight singing or playing the keyboard or whatever. So a lot of our oral skills classes were conducted with, you know, instructor videos followed by voice thread where they uploaded themselves singing or playing or whatever. Um, I did something for my pedagogy class, which was I reached out to, I would say about 20 different faculty members around the country who either teach pedagogy or have written books or written pedagogy articles or just teach in the core and did interviews with them. Hmm. So my pedagogy and filmed them. So my pedagogy students got to hear in person from a lot of the textbook authors that they were reviewing and so on. Hmm. So that's, you know, that's sort of an opportunity that you might not have thought of doing mm -hmm. otherwise. But it, yeah, yeah, it was, challenging <laughs> yeah there's been there has been some good things that have come out of zoom and and one of them is the ability to you know talk with someone across the country and and, and everyone has that ability now it's not like this weird thing oh how do i how do i zoom with you like everyone just knows yeah. it's like the the common language that we all speak now is zoom yeah well we unfortunately time has flown it's it's oh, already wow. 45 minutes when <laughs> i i, I we hardly got to all the questions and uh, it's, this has just been wonderful. We'll have to have you on and um, especially when the, the fourth edition comes out fully and, and sure. all of those things. But we do have, we like to do just some rapid fire questions uh, okay. at the very end. So these are just questions that um, uh, you have, you, you've they've been hermetically sealed. Um, no one has seen these. I don't think I even know what Ben or, and right. Jen are yep. going to ask. Um, Jen or Ben, do you want to go first? Because I haven't actually thought of mine exactly. I can start. Go for it, I can okay, start. go for it, Ben. Um, one thing I really wanted to ask you, Betsy, was that uh, what is your favorite composer or artist to teach? Since you have such a great knowledge of repertory, I had to ask you this. Oh my gosh. I hate favorite <laughs> anything questions. That's why we asked it. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, blubber around trying to figure out an answer. Of course, in real life, you know, somebody like Bach is one of my favorite composers. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say I have fallen in love with a particular piece um, actually a couple of pieces from our, the new edition of our book. So I won't say favorite composer. I'll say a couple of favorite pieces that are just haunting sure. me. One of them is by um, Fanny Hensel. Mm. 
it's a setting of the Minost. And that's been set, you know, by mm-hmm. bombs. And, but this pencil song is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it, it, like I said, it haunts me. <laughs> um, but I, I've taught it in my grad theory class, and I had the students compare it with the, with the Brahms setting. And, you know, she comes out very favorably. It's beautiful. And then there's a, a um, Clara Schumann piano sonata that is also kind of just sticking with me like earworms. And also because a student in one of my classes this semester did the recording for our textbook. And so it's, you know, in my ears and stuff. But it's just gorgeous. It's a G minor sonata. Mm-hmm. So those are two great pieces. But, you know, if you ask me who's my favorite composer, what would I say? Bach, probably. <laughs> <laughs> can't go wrong with that. You can't yeah, go wrong exactly. with Bach. <laughs> no, you went probably. exactly where I was hoping you would go yeah. with that. And I want to check out those two pieces that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. I mean, it, it, my, my Bach answer is partly because I was the, the choir and organ kind mm-hmm. of kid growing mm-hmm. up. So that was a lot of the repertoire I came to love. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So here's mine. If you were told that for the rest of your career, you can only teach one level of aural skills, one of the four levels of aural skills, but you get to pick, which of the four would it be? It would definitely be the first one. That's an easy mm-hmm. question for me because I want to set kids off mm-hmm. on the right foot, if you know okay. what I mean, and get that vocal training in and uh, get good skills going. Uh, yeah, I think that would be I'm my answer. There. That's good. <laughs> and then my question it's also fun yeah <laughs> this is a fun one what is your favorite augmented six chord nationality <laughs> <laughs> uh i think i like french because it's the crunchiest there you yeah. go all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> got that whole step <laughs> Well, this has been really fun. So as we, as we're wrapping up, um, maybe just kind of tell our listeners um, a little bit about kind of projects that you are are working on or wrapping up or things that you're planning on and how people can uh, find you if they want to ask more questions about what you're up to. Um, Well, in terms of wrapping up, as I mentioned, we just finished wrapping up the recordings for the textbook. And I never got to say uh, earlier in our discussion about the whole media package that goes with the textbooks. So there's an online component that has this ebook where all the examples are clickable, but it also has cool stuff like videos and um, formative assessment quizzes that are gamified and have you know sort of fun incentives to do them. So that's a project that's kind of being finished up now. Uh, on the research side, uh, we didn't get to talking about absolute pitch, but I'll just say that I've you know, have this stream running through my research, my whole career pretty much because of our skills teaching. And that is figuring out some of the origins of absolute pitch and also the extents of what is easy and what's hard. You know, there's a lot of challenging things for them like changing tunings and changing timbre and so on. Um, so I have a project that I've been working on with Sui and Mok who teaches at the Chinese University of Hong Kong exploring um, sort of the educational background and upbringing of students in Hong Kong versus um, the United States. And one thing that's interesting about Asian schools or Chinese schools and Hong Kong schools is they have classical Western music majors and they also have traditional Chinese music majors. And there's some really interesting differences between them having to do with studying a fixed pitch instrument in childhood. Lots of them have absolute pitch. Then these other kids who are the traditional Chinese majors who are, you know, the same ethnicity, same educational level, same background, same age, same everything. Most of them don't have absolute pitch. And it Hmm. has to do with the uh, kinds of notation, the kinds of fixed pitch uh, instruments, the expectations of their teachers. I mean, there's all kinds of things that have to do with learning and teaching. Um, So that's something to watch for. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. We'll be back with more interviews with professors and teachers who will be dropping all sorts of theory knowledge for your education, edification, and enjoyment. So until then, bye-bye.